pleased to introduce Luke Green to talk about Dr. Stevenson's Miserere. Well, thank you, Ibi, and thanks very much for the Viola de Gantt Society for inviting me. I'm just here on a week's holiday to the UK and doing a few other things, and thanks to Ibi, he really arranged to surround my trip, I think, <laughs> um, and lots of other people, so I'm really grateful. Um, now, what I'd like to show you is how I became involved in the Dr. Stevenson's project, or known as Dr. Robert Stevenson's medley, Dr. Stevens' medley, which was initiated by Lauren Ludwig, who you might know from, who's an American uh, scholar and the author now, the player. You did and, live here for a while. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Of course, you probably all know it. And in, during COVID, he put out a call for composers to try to complete the two missing parts. Um, so I'll just explain um, where they came from and everything. So um, Dr. Robert Stevenson was resident organist and composer, we think, at Chester Cathedral in flourishing around the late 1590s or so. Um, and these six part books what well, four part books were discovered, which uh, have the title of Miserere's, and then one of them has Dr. Stevenson's medley, and the two travel parts are missing. Um, and so here you can see in the right hand corner where it says Dr. Stevenson's middle, uh, medley. Um, and you might know it from where it's listed in the Dodds Ashby thematic index. It's been there for a long time. Um, and that's all we know at the moment. Um, and I wanted to play you this video interview I made, a Zoom interview with Lauren. He was the, as I say, um, gives lots of good background. I'm really indebted to you because it was your idea to create the uh, Stevenson Miserere project and to think about how we might construct the missing two parts from his six part Miserere's. When did this idea come to you? Um, well, I had, I had known about these pieces for a while. I, um, I think I first heard about them reading a dissertation on the, uh, all of the polyphonic settings of the Miserere for vials um, in a dissertation on that topic and had sort of had in, in the back of my head that it would be really fun one day to see whether composers were game to um, complete those missing parts. So when uh, COVID, st COVID started and everybody was trapped in their houses, I thought it would be a fun diversion for a particular sort of person. And I was so I was so delighted, Brooke, when you um, when you uh, you know composed your your settings of those pieces. I think that's such a that's so great that that happened. You and actually there was a wonderful response. There were um, quite a few composers. Um, spend some time on the project. And the Stevenson Miserere's are listed in the Vile Players Bible, the Dodds Ashby thematic index. And I noticed that they're called Dr. Stevenson's medley. Do you know where that came from? Um, I believe that that's just how they're titled, how they appear in the, in the one surviving source. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's curious to me, I'm curious what the word medley means in this context, but as they appear in the source, it's the seven, um, the seven Miserere's one after another, um, just as a block in all of the part books. And Dr. Robert Stevenson, we know he flourished in Chester between 1570 and 1600, and he succeeded Robert White as organist and composer at Chester Cathedral. Do you know anything more about him? Um, I don't, that's the, there's a very, there's like a one paragraph Grove entry, if I remember correctly. And um, I actually, I, I should know the other pieces that are known um, from him, but I don't, maybe you know that off the top of your head. Um, very few of his, very little information on him and very few of his pieces survive as far as I understand. Yeah. Well, according to Grove, the only instrumental work are these Miserere's that survive, and there's a couple of choral works, but not very much. But he was paid quite a lot of money uh, for his work as a copyist, 
And there's speculation that perhaps he was doing more than copying and maybe they just didn't notate it. Maybe he was actually composing and oh. being paid the same way. And the other interesting thing is that he was awarded a Doctor of Music from Oxford in 1596. And so that means he must have been held in quite high regard, I think. Yeah, and I was I was actually just looking at um, there's this wonderful dissertation by uh, Edwards, the sources of Elizabethan consort music, which is one of those sources like Dodd that we all go back to again and again. And um, Edwards actually uh, also he's he's I, I'm curious about this because he ascribes initially those works to Bird, and um, that's another suggestion that Stevenson's music is quite good if if scholars of that repertory are thinking it might be by Bird. Oh, and when you were copying out and transcribing the parts, did any of it remind you of Bird? Um, well, from the standpoint of um, it being, you know, late 16th century English polyphony, it was reminiscent. I'm certainly not enough of a Bird expert that I'd feel like that uh, that would be significant if I did have that feeling. And what was it like copying them out? I mean, they're very sort of squashed up and it looks like it would have been a labor of love to me. It was, um, it was, it wasn't too bad. It was a little thorny. Um, the main problem was that the staff lines had disappeared. And so in the, in the source or in the scan that I had anyway, so, um, it was, I took a ruler, you know, digitally, I took a ruler and had to add the staff lines back. And um, another interesting aspect of the piece is something that you actually handled really beautifully in your, um, in your completions is that <clears throat> the fact that many of the voices move into a triple subdivision of the beat. And in the original sources, that's indicated using coloration. It's, you actually it's the black notes are when, when the subdivision is triple and then the white, the hollow notes are, he used that notation, the coloration notation system to make that distinction between the duple and the triple subdivisions. Um, so that's a little hard to read and there are some ambiguities there. Um, so there was certainly some sort of head scratching and trying different solutions as we kind of always end up doing when we're dealing with those sources. Yes. Yeah. And another thing I noticed when I was trying to write my versions was that there's interesting, for want of a better term, cross relations. You know, you've got an F sharp against an F natural. Yeah. And lo either lovely clashes or hideous clashes, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, having now worked with a lot of 16th century sort of Elizabethan consort music from this era, um, I really think that the cross relations were the language of dissonance that those composers had access to, and that the the tendency of some modern musicians to sort of shy away from the cross relations, I, I think maybe misses the point a little bit that those those composers um, were bound by particular rules, and one of the places that they found that they could get really dissonant sonorities was with the use of cross relations with which obeyed the formal rules of counterpoint that they were using, but also created these really bracing, beautiful dissonant sonorities. So um, in general, I'm always looking for cross relations in that repertory. And I feel like Stevenson leveraged that really nicely. And it was cool how a lot of composers um, took the opportunity to find cross relations in the replacement voices that they made. Um, and I actually don't remember right off the top of my head if that was a technique that you used or not. But um, but that's a wonderful opportunity for dissonance in that uh, in that 16th century repertory. Yeah, and you mentioned the counterpoint, and I think that's quite important. I'm just guessing here because what I found interesting looking at the original part books was each of the would be titled with a part name and then the word mensuralis cantus. I think that means polyphonic part. Have you seen that in other vial part books? Um, not off the top of my head, but I'd have to go back and uh, and look at my favorites and see if that phrase appears. Yeah, because I anyway, I was just speculating and thinking, was it a partly a sort of didactic teaching or theoretical purpose that he might have had to specify that, because. 
I'm just wondering if he might have been sort of engaging in those sort of debates over the virtues of polyphony versus plain chant, which was among music theorists of that time. Um, and so I just thought it was a little bit unusual to specify that, I think. Not that I'm a great scholar either, so, you know, I can't really say. <laughs> well, the, um, this Cantus Firmus, like late 16th century Cantus Firmus repertory was really closely as associated with pedagogy and with the, at, at this point, as I understand it, the um, many cathedral schools like the one at Chester used the vial as one of the teaching tools with choristers. And Cantus Firmus Polyphony, like the Inomine, the Miserere, these pieces that are built around a slow moving bit of liturgical chant, like the Miserere chant, um, were very closely associated with those pedagogical contexts. Like I happen to, I happen to remember that Chester is one of the places that we have records of choristers being taught on vials. So um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there's a didactic thing happening here. And um, sometimes people hear didactic and they think that that means the music isn't that interesting or beautiful. And I actually think that this repertory of Cantus Firmus polyphony from the late 16th century is, it's one of my favorite repertories. Yeah, so that's great to think that maybe the choir members at Chester played this music and maybe they played just behind me because I've got the choir behind me. Um, do you think they might have been played domestically as well? Um, possibly. I, I think that the, um, the viol became a domestic instrument a bit later for the most part. I mean, there were some of the great houses in the 16th century did have viols as part of their music, but the kind of the viola da gamba as a like um, amateur pastime for the aristocracy is, a, I think, in the later generations. And I think that that's partly because these choristers that were learning the viol in the late 16th century, um, when they grew up, they were they became the sort of composers in residence at a lot of these great houses. And that's how the viol tradition made its way into the aristocratic houses in the you know early 17th and mid 17th century. Yeah, well, this is going to be so exciting to see what happens at the end of this project. And I'm really looking forward to Lestrange Viles, your group, doing your versions. Um, so thank you very much. I think we might leave it there and let you go back to sheltering in the age of COVID. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Lauren. Right on. Well, thank you, Brooke, and thank you so much for your um, your beautiful contribution to this repertory. I think it's um, the in my mind, what we're trying to do with old music is find a way to have kind of rich and meaningful and um, rich experiences of the now with it. And um, it's so wonderful to feel like we're sort of advancing the repertory a little bit and and advancing the tradition and experiencing it in that way. So it's wonderful that you and the other composers contributed in this way to the repertory. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> that was Laurie. And um, I haven't heard back from him as to what eventuated from the project from his perspective, which was to collect them all, um, the recordings that he, sorry, the uh, scores that he received. And he was going to create um, a recording of his favorite uh, selections. So there might be one or two movements from each of the composers that submitted. Um, but I think that project is still um, happening. Um, but what actually happened in the meantime for me was I said to him, well, would you mind if my group just recorded them all and created our own project as well as yours? And he said, no, absolutely, just go ahead and do what you like. So that was very nice. Um, so I'll just let you know a few little things that I discovered in the process of doing this about the miserere. So the first thing to know is that there are different types of miserere's, like the nomine, it's derived from a chant. And the chant that we're talking about in this context is the miserere mihi domini, not that famous miserere me deus, which you might know from Mozart's miserere or Allegri's Mozart, uh, Allegri Mozart's Miserere. And um, here we have 
the Miserere, written out by Peter Denner. I don't know if anyone knows him, but he's a scholar who wrote a huge thesis on the Miserere. And he said there were over 3,000 written in England between 1450 and 1650. And this compares to about 150 in nominates. So this is yet to be, you know, brought back into the limelight, I think. 3,000. Apparently, that, that's instrumental, you know, yeah. every, every type of instrumental combination you think of, probably a lot of keyboard music. So I haven't validated that claim, but he does say So the Miserere and Polyphony functions in a similar way to the Innomine, in that you have the long slow notes and polyphony weaving around it. Um, so then I started thinking about where uh, Dr. Stevenson was working and then the strange similarity of the word miserere and misericorde, which you can find on the back of the choir stall seats mm -hmm. at Chester Cathedral in particular and elsewhere too, but yeah. Chester Cathedral is very famous for its miserere. You can say misericorde. Um, and then I was thinking about, well, oh, there's an example, there's a mon monkey mis misericord, um, here's a dragon, one. <laughs> there's so many good ones. Um, and it does mean the mercy seat, the misericord, sorry, I should go back to what that was. Yeah. Um, and it's a folded up seat um, that they, the choir members would feel when they're standing up to sing or standing for long periods because they feel it on the back of their legs. Um, and as I said, it could be anything really. It could be an angel, a monkey, some sort of whimsical uh, carved relief. And I was thinking, well, how should we regard these misericords? Were they church ornament? Are they subversive art or um, both, perhaps? And a misericord can have other meanings. It can also refer to a room in a monastery where dispensation from fasting has been granted. So it also implies a relaxation of monastic rules. Um, it could be a dagger. The word misericord could also be a dagger used to give the death stroke the coup de grace to a wounded knight in medieval times, um, the ultimate relaxation. Um, and um, I also thought perhaps um, it implies a sort of space where things can happen that are a little bit unofficial, a bit like in Marginalia. You know, you have uh, medieval manuscripts with really interesting little uh, cartoonish type illustrations on the side of the official text. Um, anyway, there were just thoughts that were going through my mind in preparation for writing things. So what I'd like to play you now is the four-part version, what survives from Dr. Stevenson, sort of what I had to start with. And luckily um, we made a recording of this with my group. So I'll just play you this.
showing you is the things that I noticed which then helped me write my own version for the top two parts. Um, so this might be a little bit harder to get, but anyway, if you see here, the first thing I sort of noticed was the shape. Beautiful form, he always has lovely shape. Um, the arching sort of shapes. And then the connections with um, this falling forth, dun, 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 um, which you can sort of hear, um, which I've brought in later. That's a sort of rather blow my tears almost, Dalman esque motive that many people know. And then you can sort of see it coming in here. And then, that's right after all that polyphony. So just ignore the top two parts. You can see how this motive becomes homogenous there. So I then made mine homogenous with this in rhythm. Because I thought, oh, that must be a really significant part. But that they have to align there. And then mostly I did a lot of imitation. Um, and sometimes I could create a, an illusion of imitation, such as in here, which then comes down there, which that's the original, obviously. But, um, and there's an imitation here and there, and you can sort of see, see that there. And I did a lot of analysis also of um, intervallic um, congruences and things. And that, that, that similar motive, yeah, that's one. And then going up there. Um, and the gold star here is for Stevenson when he broke the rules. <laughs> um, so that is a bit of a no-no in strict harmony and counterpoint. You can't have two leaps of a fourth like that. Within, after you've done a leap, you're supposed to come back down again. Um, and then here he's done two leaps again. That's almost permissible. But it's sort of, you know, it's on the edge. Um, <laughs> so, um, not, not a fourth. The first one isn't a fourth. That's right. Yes, yeah, that's what I mean. So that's sort of okay. But, you know, really, you shouldn't be doing that. Can I just comment? It, it, yes. it, 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 look, it, it sounds less scary than it looks. I mean, what that's the, right. What's wrong with the, with the dots? I know, yes. yes. Um, that was Lauren's choice oh. to, because of the duple against triple, um, for instance, here. Yeah. <coughs> he sort of took as the constant the dotted notes, yeah. which, to be honest, I wouldn't have done. But I was the trouble was I had to submit my versions in the format that he provided yeah. because they were reading them that way. So are the dots in the original? No. What's the original menstruation? So yeah, yeah it's more like this. Yeah. The menstruation yeah. sign. It's just in. Um, Comp uh, sorry, duple. Mm. Duple. Yes. yes. Cut C. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is not meant by it. No, but this is actually how, how it is, except for the dots. Yeah. Yeah, except for the dots. <laughs> which I, I also, everyone found confusing. And I never really got to the bottom of why he chose that way instead of the other way around. But as I say, I was a bit stuck in this format because it was his project. Um, so after a while you get used to it, so if you're reading it. But yeah. So the dotted notes are, in inverted commas, normal notes, whereas the normal ones are irregular note pairs. Yes. Mm. yes, 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 yes. Um, mm. So, it, as I say, it sounds a lot more straightforward than it looks. So what do you yes. do when you do have a dot? Because you just play them as, as, as duple, yeah. Yes. So, the, the constant, it's like reading in 12-8. Um, yeah. So um, it's like two groups of six in each bar. So they're like two groups of 6-8 in, in each bar. Yeah. And then the dotted crotchet is the constant B. Yeah. So yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> no, 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 I totally get it. And if I could, I would rewrite them. I haven't published them. Okay. If I was going to publish them for money, I would rewrite yeah. them. I was thinking, mm. so if you yeah. want a dotted note, maybe there aren't any in the whole piece, how would you notate it? Exactly. Because it's, a, it's got a dot anyway. So you get a dotted minute. The the top, minute. Top, top from the top. Well, they do. Mm. This, is, this is a dot. It's not quite dotted. That's a, a yeah. tie. Yeah. 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 Ye
the notation affected the way you've done your comp composition in any way? No, not so, this so, notation. So, so, so my compositions don't look like this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you do your completion, has, has the way he's notated it affected the way um, you've approached no, it? No, no, I don't think so. I, I just... So it's in the relevance, really? Yeah, yeah, you just get used to it. It's just like a slightly different language, but it's, mm -hmm. as I say, it's not a complicated one once you get used to it. Anyway, um, I think what I'll do at this point is just play you the versions. And um, this is, as I say, there are um, seven miseraries, and this is number three. I just gave it the title of Consolation because that was the mood that I wanted to create. In our recordings, we repeat and automate on the second time. Um, I'm sorry to deny you the pleasure, but I will just keep going so that we don't get too it's stuck beautiful. on one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really lovely. Oh, thank and you. a huge gold star. Oh well, that's another uh, yeah. one from Mr. Dr. Stevenson. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so that was number three. And I'm actually playing you the two most straightforward ones, to be honest. Um, so now this is number six. Um, and perhaps I'll just play you the four part version for this as well. but I had to sort of create the imitation a little bit in the beginning um, and what's rather nice about this is that it's in a sort of G major-ish sonority with a flattened seventh and then here we have the B flat so even in the second bar I felt that that was important to actually make clear not to have a crash Oh yes, it reach, reaches a big climax here because we broke it F. Um, so 
I did that. Um, and I did also, I tried to sort of be what I understand as the basic tenets of 16th century polyphony, where you do a lot of contrary motion um, and you can have some following through of imitation um, and then manipulation of motives, you know, just slight variances of things. Um, not you to imitate for a little while, then you find you can't continuously do it, so it's a good excuse to vary it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, you can sort of see there how all those motives will connect. So, are all these seven part pieces without the uh, two other parts? Yeah, they're six part pieces. Six part pieces. Yeah, the seven miseraries that are six parts. So, each. seven miseraries. Yeah, missing yeah. the top missing. two parts. Yeah. And, and yeah. the way you um, reconstructed the these two top parts. Uh, do they ever intertwine, or are they yes. equal trebles, or are they? Uh, They're equal trebles, but they often cross right. and take over. So there's no real leader yeah. in the sense, you know, that treble one is just it's as important as treble two. A, um, a treble part, and then a lower. No, no, they're definitely part. stereophonic as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I forgot to keep saying that um, the miserere line, you can see, is in the tenor part. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, here we go. Again, we re repeated that one. So did he we did Lauren say that the top two parts had to be treble? Because um, did you know that they were equal, or did you just guess? Because it could have been like a mm -hmm. one higher and then a different yeah. Well, then we'd, you'd have three tenors. That was pretty clear by the range that we had two tenor lines and two bass lines. Though, as with you know, those things are often a bit ambiguous. But, um, yeah, you could have had one treble and, I think you would have had to have one treble and then one tenor, but the way I wanted to write was was like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a choice I had to make, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this one, um, I was just going to say, on my website, on Josie and the Emeralds website, um, you can see videos of all these. And that's an example of, of the first one. But um, I won't play you those right now, but if you want to go onto the website and look under videos, you'll find it, uh, another tab that says Dr. Stevenson's medley, and you can hear them there. Um, so what I also wanted to just sort of talk about me as a composer being inspired by um, things like this, um, and another very useful device for me has been the nomine, which I'm sure many other contemporary composers have also used. Now, I don't need to explain to you the origins of the nomine. I'm sure you all know that. Um, so a piece that I've written using the nomine was to commemorate Chavela Vargas, Vargas um, also just known as Chavela, who was um, a sort of folk 
folk singer in Mexico um, who died in 2012. And um, I wrote a piece uh, just called Chavela. And um, you can see the Inome line there in the treble bar. Mm -hmm. And it can be sung or just played with another treble bar. So um, I'll just play you that. And. Um, Latino feel there. Um, and um, so directly after writing the Dr. Stevenson's project, I thought, oh, I must write in Zerera now. So um, I was also watching Netflix 51 episode series <laughs> of Empress Key <laughs> during COVID, which I probably would watch anyway, whether it's COVID or not. Um, and very inspired by the watch buckling uh, warrior Empress Key, of course, it's all it's like you know, imagination. I think um, she was a medieval warrior, apparently, but definitely became um, the ruling empress um, of the Huan Dynasty in um, about fourteenth century, um, and so. I sort of mixed the main theme of from the TV show with notions of polyphony and the miserere held the whole thing together, as you do. And so the red circled notes represent the miserere. And originally I wrote it in 4-2, so it would have been one note per bar, just like you would expect with the inomine. But then Subsequently, uh, it was easier just to write the whole thing out in four, four, and two bars, you know, uh, where they used to do one. So we are going to now play you this, and you can hear, maybe hear the hidden in nominee. So originally I did actually, so not, I mean, miserere. I it did actually write it for six files, and there was one part playing the miserere. But then it was too hard to get six plays together, and so I just made it four, and I took out the nominee and then just make sure that it is hidden in other parts. Thank you. 
love theme, and <laughs> then there's more battles, Ooh. and then there's some resolution. Um, I just... <laughs>
There's an Australian Music Centre website, and I'm a composer on that, and I've got some pieces published on that. So you can look at that. It's not too difficult, you know. So we, we put it together in five minutes. <laughs> Have you entered it in the trainer competition, the US? Um, no, because the rules of that are that you can't have performed it before you submit it. Oh. And the problem is I got impatient and I usually just write something for an upcoming concert and I had to had do to that for the concert and so yeah. it was too late. I ask because it seems quite accessible and yet yeah. unusual, perfect for the Yeah, time. probably oh, would have been good, but never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Um, okay. Uh, and so another piece I've written that um, is on the CD over there, um, called, it's called Phoenix Chicon, and that's because I wanted to write a Chicon, really, because um, I, I asked um, Lisa Terry, um, what's your sort of favourite form? I was going to write her a piece, and she said, oh, I love Marais Chicons. <laughs> So I started investigating that and I thought, okay, I'll write a French Baroque Chacon. Um, and with the idea of the phoenix falling down from the sky and rising up again. That's the sort of simplistic version. Um, so I might, oh, I might play you that. I'll move my okay, back. And again, I tried to sort of be French Baroque with the rules and affects, mostly. So, uh, here we are. So, at first, that's not as bad as it looks. That's the, the sort of <laughs> twiddling, 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 coming down the sky, from the sky. That's the phoenix falling down the sky. Um, and then you can see, after all, we've all through that sort of one after another. And then you can see um, the Chicon theme, which I've circled, which uh, is introduced by Fiorbo and the bass file number five, bar five. And um, you can sort of see the little motifs that that was constructed out of um, and the French Baroque rhythms that I created from out of that, to create that, yeah. Um, and also, the, then the melody line, which is circled in the next two bars, the final two bars on that page. Um, I'm just using contramotion, really. So, um, comes terribly clear, I'm sure. <laughs>
that to me going to the highest yeah. harmonic, <laughs> sort of, I don't know, any note off the end of the fingerboard, no. just any odd note. Um, yeah. <laughs> published that um, with alternatives to uh, the really crazy bass bar parts because it can be played in slightly easier versions because at one point they don't all this you know and um, it was because I had two really good bar players and like yeah you know, and I thought right okay I'll give you something to keep you interested um, but yeah you can actually play that one with a slightly easier version um, so, yeah, and it exists on the website also, um, you can see us playing live, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was basically all I was going to do today and say, um, as you asked, that you can find my webpage there um, and you can find the music if you so desire. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.